Truth Espresso, episode 231. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> and now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Hello there friends, family, foes, and lurkers alike. This is your host, Daniel Minnick, and I have with me my sweet and beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea, and we are here to talk about the current situation with three radically pro-abortion bills that have gone through the Colorado State Senate and then the Colorado House of Representatives. And so, uh, sweetheart, ready to cover this very interesting topic (laughs) once again with me, sweetheart? (laughs) Yes, I think I'm ready to (laughs) tackle this with you. (laughs) I'm just glad I get to tackle it with you. (laughs) Yes, definitely, sweetheart. And so before we um, get into it, kind of to set the mood, the topic with this, I want to start with a verse. Yes, so... I think that after these last two weeks of listening to hour upon hour, would you estimate it was like close to 60 hours? Yeah, I was going to say we've literally listened to dozens, plural, of hours. Yeah, (laughs) and just all the evil that we've heard discussed and the lies that people believe and promote. And this verse kind of resonated with me on what we have been hearing And so hopefully this is an encouragement in some ways, too, for our listeners as well. So Psalms 52, verse 3, it says, Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Selah. And so I think that, to me, it's one of those verses, like, why would that be an encouragement? But when you listen to all that evil being spoken, then you just know like, okay, those people, they love evil. They're going to be speaking evil because they want to promote that. They don't understand truth because they don't have truth in them. Mm. They don't have Jesus Christ in their lives to help them understand righteousness and good and love and the truth. Yeah, as Jesus says in John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what we heard hour upon hour from the Colorado legislature, both in the Senate and the House, the majorities there, that they hate truth and they hate life. Yeah, it's like, we have to say that we have imbibed a long, steady diet the last few weeks of hearing, like, I think it's the probably the most evil I've ever heard before. And to listen to hour upon hour of it, just with impunity, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it is very difficult to hear that. And But that's why when we turn to the Word of God and read verses, they give us hope because they reorient us and ground us in the truth and the hope and the value of life. And so we know that these people who pretty much feel like they're gods, you know, that they control everything and they can do what they want with impunity because they feel like they have all the power and they have got their gods. But we know history and we know the future. We've seen kingdoms rise and fall in history where the Egyptian pharaoh thinks he's a god. And yeah, what happened? happen to those kind of empires the roman persecutors the emperors there they had people call them gods and yet oh yeah they're buried in the sands of time and stuff so yeah but what endures the truth you know the truth of who god is the truth of the gospel has endured kingdom after kingdom uh, long after these spawns of satan have had their reign and then get destroyed and fall get buried under the sands of time as yet another relic of history and yeah So, yes, reading the Word of God definitely gives us hope and realize, you know, these people are 
God shall laugh at them. So this last week was kind of busy for us. We found out that the House was going to hear the committee, the different bills, um, Senate Bill 23-188 and 190, and we spent a good majority of our weekends <laughs> um, trying to prepare for testifying against those bills, knowing that they were probably going to come up pretty soon. And so then Tuesday, we were able to testify against the bills on the House floor this time. <laughs> and this time, it was way easier, I guess, <laughs> and a lot more encouraging for me because I had two extra special people like <laughs> join in, yeah. um, being willing to stand up for truth and having that courage to testify. So um, my younger sister stood up and testified, and then you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that was just so special, and I'm so thankful that you guys had that courage again to stand up and speak truth, so thank you. And yeah, thank you, sweetheart, for even the idea of like, hey, would you like to do this with me? And so I think like, okay, there's so much we want to say and we only get two minutes to do it. So, hey, you know, anything that you might want to say or vice versa, you know, I might want to say that we won't be able to fit in two minutes. Well, two people can, we could get four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what I did with my sister too. I was yeah. like, Hey, cause my speech is too long. Can you take one of the sections here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that helps kind of having a small little team of us to <laughs> try and get as much truth in, like you said, in that short amount of time. And so on this episode, what we're going to see as we play clips, first our testimonies, and then these last two episodes, you've been hearing clips of um, people testifying, and then also clips of the legislators debating amendments to these bills. And in this episode, you're going to hear contradiction after contradiction, lie after lie, saying one thing out of one side of their mouth, and then saying the exact opposite on the other side of their mouth. And, you know, it happens over and over again. And the uh, majority party who ultimately are responsible for passing these atrocious bills. And we're going to, you know, as we have time here, we're going to explain. We've talked about them in the last two episodes, but, you know, we can briefly recap a little bit about what these bills are and what they really have for ramifications, you know, and these people heard truth bombs. They heard truth, you know, like you would not believe, like the truth and the facts and the details and the reports and statistics. And, you know, they didn't have much to offer as far as that. All they had to offer was ideology and emotion. But the opposition absolutely showered them with facts, took them to task, took them behind the woodshed, as it were. And, you know, it's like, pwned them <laughs> like there's no tomorrow with the truth but because they're the majority they could care less it's like they put their fingers in the ears and say la 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 blah 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 i could care less what you're saying you know i could care less that two plus two equals four i don't believe any truth and so we're you know we're going to play our testimonies and then we'll play some very salient clips that's going to show how things progressed and and so, sweetheart, the first clip that we'll have is your testimony, sweetheart, on Bill 188, which was about protecting, you know, so-called reproductive health care providers, i.e. abortionists and gender-affirming care practitioners <laughs> from, you know, any investigations, lawsuits, gathering evidence, and so on. So here's your testimony on that bill. All right. Uh, Ms. Minnick, is that you ready to go here? Yes. Okay, please yes, go sir. ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Minnick. I am a women's health practitioner representing myself. It is interesting when comparing SB 188 and SB 190. SB 188, this bill, seeks to protect abortion providers from any discipline or regulations for health and safety, whereas SB 190 seeks to criminalize health care providers who want to help women who desire to attempt to reverse the effect of mifeprestone 
by administering natural progesterone. I find this confusing that reproductive health care is only defined and acknowledged if it includes abortion care and birth control options. This would protect entities such as Planned Parenthood. However, Planned Parenthood only provides those services. They do not provide prenatal care, postpartum care, breast exams, and such. SB 188 will even protect abortion providers from prescribing abortion medications in other states that have placed a ban on abortion pills. And unfortunately, women who have complications and maybe even die from the abortion pill, the abortion provider is protected under this bill, and there will be no legal recourse or practice investigation. Any abortion provider can flee from the original state and start practicing in Colorado. We will be and they will be protected against any actions brought against them from their previous practice. So far, there have been no arrests made, one charge made that was dismissed against abortion providers. Ultimately, this is unsafe. SB 188 will be on the map for the worst state to go for medical services and health care by removing these safeguards for abortion providers. This bill does not increase safety and access to abortion, but rather increases the risk of complications and will deter people from coming to Colorado. I respectfully ask for a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's a good job there, sweetheart, and I have to commend you for the good testimony there, but (laughs) like... It seemed like there's so much that was going on during that time. If you want to talk about, like, you were definitely multitasking at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for anyone who has not participated in testifying, like, thankfully, in Colorado, they allow remote testimony. And that was helpful for us because when you testify, you are listening in for when your name is called up. They usually call up people in groups of four or five and then they alternate like proponents and opponents and you just have to listen in for when your name is going to be called and most of these testimonies when they're these more critical debatable issues they can go on for a long time most of them are like around 12 hours or more so it's a long time to be listening in not knowing when you're going to present and so we were yeah, listening in on the computer. Um, it was also the same day that I helped watch a little baby. And <laughs> so I was holding her. She was falling asleep for her nap. And at the same time, I had a phone call right when my name got called. So I'm holding the baby, answering a phone call on my business line. And it was actually a neat opportunity on the business line for a nurse practitioner student who wants to come um, train with me to learn more about how to provide health care and still hold to your faith and your values. And so I finally was able to get off the phone with her and <laughs> was ready to testify. So, yes, it was definitely a time of multitasking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, okay, that definitely showed, you know, what you're capable of doing there. <laughs> like, okay, try to be psyched up to testify while you're you know, holding a baby. You know, and I was trying to help you. Okay, maybe I could hold her, but she's like got a death grip on you. And so <laughs> wouldn't let go. And like, okay, hopefully, you know, she, she stays calm. And then once you got the phone call and they're like, the people are going through the panel doing the testimonies. And I'm like, okay, how do I help with this? How long is this call going to take? What are they going to drop you? Like what's going to happen here? But it it all worked out. (laughs) Yeah. And that was uh, 188 there. And then later on in the evening, so that was, let's see, when did that happen? Was it like around? I think around one o'clock. Okay. One o'clock in the afternoon. And then later on in the evening, so after 10 p.m. So yes, we have been paying attention, listening. I was working from home too, but trying to be attentive too. And and then after 10 p.m., it was finally our time to testify for Bill 190, which is the one that uh, accuses pregnancy centers of deceptive practices to make it hard for them to advertise. 
claiming that if if someone's looking for an abortion and happens to stumble into a pregnancy center, allegedly stumble into it, you know, then it might get the pregnancy centers in trouble if they don't offer abortion, that they're somehow deceiving people. But also it, the same bill tries to outlaw uh, the abortion pill reversal protocol. And then, so Sui, are you testified against that one too? So I will play that. All right, um, Chelsea Minnick, we see your cameras on. You're ready to go. Uh, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Minnick. I am a women's health practitioner. I'm here representing myself. SB 190 sponsors claim that the abortion pill reversal is unsafe and experimental and unprofessional. However, the abortion pill regimen is unsafe and experimental. Mifeprestone has resulted in at least 30 deaths among women. The exact number is unknown as this is not mandated to be reported in all states. With the approval of the abortion pill over the counter and by mail, this death rate is only going to increase. The FDA recommends women have an ultrasound prior to receiving the abortion pill to rule out an ectopic pregnancy and verify gestational age. But now women will not receive adequate and safe health care. In contrast, the abortion pill reversal uses natural progesterone, and there have been zero reported deaths. In 2022, the UK investigated the use of the APR and deemed that it was safe and did not increase the risk of hemorrhage, such as the abortion pill regimen does. And then SB 190 is unprofessional. According to the AMA, unprofessional refers to any practice that is detrimental to the patient. The abortion pill is detrimental to both babies and women. The abortion pill has a high morbidity and mortality rate, and yet this is the practice that is being promoted and protected from any regulations or liability. On the other hand, APR does not kill women, and it can even help a woman continue her pregnancy when she seeks this option with a success rate of at least 68%. The American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists concur that APR is safe and effective, And this should remain an option for women to choose. I respectfully urge members of the House to reject this bill. All right. Thank you. So in your testimony there, you talked about the contradiction. As we talk about contradictions in this episode, you talked about the contradiction between what Bill 188 does in effect and what Bill 190 does in effect that does not show a whole lot of consideration for being consistent because 188, as you mentioned, tries to protect abortion providers and anything that they consider reproductive health care from possible legal issues, uh, legal challenges. You know, unless they've committed a criminal act, you're not even allowed to gather evidence and stuff because the sacramental health care is done for providing abortion. But at the same time, Bill 190, on the other hand, has Section 3 in it, which purports to outlaw the abortion pill reversal because it's allegedly unproven. And so what that is, is giving progesterone, a natural hormone, to reverse the effects of the first abortion pill, mifepristone. And you talked about how that contradicts because... Wait, we can allow all this latitude for reproductive health care providers and abortions, even if they, so they're immune, even if dangerous things or harm actually happens, but somehow giving progesterone to a woman who wants to continue her pregnancy is unsafe and unproven. That is a blatant contradiction that is only allowed by these people who sponsor these bills because of their anti-truth ideology. Yeah, so I remember just preparing this short testimony that I wanted to use what we heard the sponsors claim frequently during the Senate committee and the Senate hearing that they said the abortion pill reversal is unsafe and experimental it's unprofessional, and it's unproven. 
-hmm. And the more I thought about that, I was like, but wait a minute, that actually applies to the abortion pill, (laughs) mifeprestone. All those things should be applied to that because the abortion pill is unsafe. We've had over 30 deaths. Mm -hmm. It's experimental. It's an off-label use for this kind of procedure. Um, It's unprofessional. We're saying that it's okay to not even go with the recommendations the FDA puts out as far as doing screening for these women that are taking it. They can get it over the counter. They can get it in mail. We don't know if they have an ectopic pregnancy, if they've already miscarried, if it's you know a live baby in there or not. And if it's a molar pregnancy, which could have a positive pregnancy test, but it's actually just a gestational sac that's growing and you have to be very on top of monitoring that patient because that can quickly grow into a cancer situation. And also, we don't know how far along she is. So Mm. these are certain criteria that the FDA put in place to make sure that if you're going to administer mifeprestone as an abortifacient, that you have these different safety levels there. And with the mail-in and over-the-counter, that takes away all of that. So that would be considered unprofessional because Mm. we're actually putting more harm or the risk of harm is increased tremendously. And then also unproven. It's just interesting how they often claim something to try and say this is, you know, (laughs) the pregnancy center issue or access to reproductive health care, gender affirming care, the abortion pill reversal. They try and put all these claims on those. And then we step back and look at it. You're like, wait, that doesn't make sense. Like you said, it's contradictory to (laughs) something they spoke to earlier or something that this other bill is saying. And that's what happens when you don't have that foundation of truth. Then there's (laughs) going to be contradiction. And these people could care less. They're made aware of it. They knew it and they embraced it with gusto. So next to have um, my testimony that I did. And unfortunately, as I listened to the archive, the recording of this, somehow my webcam microphone must not have picked up my voice very well. It sounds very muffled. So we're going to do a reconstruction of my testimony there. Okay, I see. Is it Minnick? Again, a different one. (laughs) I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Thank you. You have two minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Committee. My name is Daniel Minnick. I am a software engineer in the manufacturing industry representing myself. The Senate Committee heard testimony from Dr. Mitchell Crane in the OBGYN who argued from his randomized controlled trial that medication abortion reversal is medical fraud. Dr. Cranin is a paid consultant for Danco Laboratories, which produces mifepristone. He is far from an unbiased opinion. I would like to thank Dr. Bowles for bringing up the rat study. Uh, Dr. Cranin reasoned from his trial that if women take mifepristone without taking misoprostol, bad things can happen. So, mifepristone alone could be dangerous? Yet, in a Wired article last year, Dr. David Grossman, a clinical research director, and Dr. Michelle Quinn, an OBGYN, both claim mifeprestone is weak by itself. They recommend women who change their minds simply forego the misoprostol and wait and see. So, mifeprestone alone could be safe? Which is it? What is the best and safest medical option for women who regret taking mifepristone? Something is not quite right here. My esteemed representatives, abortion pill reversal is simply progesterone. Progesterone is often prescribed during the first trimester to aid pregnancy. If a woman wants to exercise her fundamental right to continue a pregnancy, why deny her a natural hormone? Why is progesterone okay in early pregnancy except in this case? SB 190 also libels the goodwill of pregnancy centers without presenting evidence in the bill. The original draft of this bill even called them fake clinics. Make no mistake, this bill is pure political activism. Colorado has over... 
Colorado has over 50 pregnancy centers. Abortion pill reversal is ubiquitous in all 50 states and 86 countries. SB 190 is extreme, unprecedented, and unnecessary. It resolves no emergency. Thank you. If you could wrap up your testimony. Can you wrap up? I respectfully uh, urge a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Aw, good job, babe. I'm so proud of you. And yes, just so encouraged to have you stand with me and like fight this evil that we listened to and heard and saw. And that's not easy to do. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely, sweetheart. I was very glad to do that. And once again, with my testimony as well, I pointed out a contradiction because, as we talked about in the last two episodes, we mentioned Dr. Mitchell Cranin, who was a star witness in support of the bill. He claims to have done the only clinical trial that actually counts that tests the abortion reversal. And of course, because several women there, I believe it was four out of the 10, ended up having to go to the ER, he stopped the trial short and basically claims in his testimony that that proves that giving the mifepristone and not taking the second pill, the misoprostol, is dangerous. But so I said, okay, so taking the first pill without taking the second is dangerous. But then I quoted from a Wired article that lists two basically his cohorts there because he's done work with Dr. David Grossman and they agree with him but they said that if a pregnant woman wanted to not finish the protocol they want to maintain their pregnancy after taking the mifepristone to just wait and see and it's kind of strange it's like okay we can't approve progesterone for reversing mifepristone because somehow that's unproven and unsafe so it's better just to wait and see but dr cranin's clinical trial is pushed as the ultimate and only test that proves that abortion reversal is unsafe and dangerous and it's dangerous allegedly because you don't take the second pill So I hope that makes sense, but the idea is that taking the first pill without taking the second is bad, bad, bad. But then we're told also, well, the first pill is weak. About 50% of pregnancies continue after taking it. So if you don't want to finish the regimen, just don't take the second pill. But what about that randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial there that allegedly demonstrates that it's unsafe and dangerous? There's your contradiction. Is it dangerous or is it completely safe? (laughs) And why not allow a pregnant woman to take progesterone rather than not, rather than wait and see, unless, of course, they're trying to hide the fact that progesterone really works to reverse the effects of mifepristone and save the life of the baby. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, therefore laying aside falsehood, Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another for his name's sake. What's up, everybody? I'm Jamal Bandy, the host of the Prescribed Truth Podcast, where I seek to distribute the truth that the doctor prescribes to the church and the world today. The Lord graciously brought me out of a cult in 2010, saved me in 2013, and in 2017, Prescribed Truth began. My mission has been to spread the truth of God's word while refuting dangerous lies affecting most churches and the culture at large from a biblical and reformed perspective. Join me on Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern time for the live recording of the podcast on YouTube and download the audio version wherever podcasts can be found, including the Christian podcast community. If you would like to know more about Prescribed Truth, please visit my website at prescribedtruth.com. And remember, this world is full of errors, but the only thing that the doctor prescribes is truth. Blessings. So now the next clip that I have is from Dr. Charles Bowles, who works for Heartbeat International. He's the director of the abortion pill reversal protocol. And he also, when asked about why there seems to be contradictions in the medical profession over whether abortion pill reversal works or doesn't work, 
he references ACOG's Bulletin 225 that itself, within that same bulletin, includes contradictions. They published a document in October of 2021, ACOG Technical Bulletin number 225. It is, an, it is a bulletin that describes in detail uh, the ins and outs of handling medication abortion for patients. Early in the document, they refer to the concept of reversal as having no credible evidence. And then at the end of the document, when they advise providers of medication abortion on how to uh, provide birth control for patients, they warn the physician who has just provided the medication abortion not to use progesterone for birth control because it can reduce the effectiveness of the methapristone. And in fact, they quote a study that cites the evidence that one particular form of progesterone used for birth control, if administered on the same day the methapristone is given, will quadruple the failure rate for the methapristone, in effect reversing the methapristone. So which is it? Don't talk about progesterone for reversing um, medication abortion because there's no evidence it worked, or don't you dare give progesterone for birth control after you've done a medication abortion because it might keep her pregnant. Which is it? So when you see that kind of internal contradiction from what is thought of as the leading professional organization, you have to ask yourself whose evidence can be trusted. So ACOG, because everyone references ACOG as an authority, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, that's the God class there, that's the expert class, that if they say something, no one can contradict it. That's the ultimate final authority, or one of them anyway. And so ACOG had published a bulletin, number 225, that was talking about medication abortion and the idea or the concept of reversal and is it effective. And so it, as uh, Dr. Bowles mentioned, that bulletin said that there's no evidence that progesterone reverses the effects of mifepristone. But then later on, (laughs) it talks about a clinical trial kind of as evidence of, yeah, you know, because progesterone or even synthetic progesterones are often given as a form of birth control. And you might be able to explain it briefly a little bit, sweetheart. So the form of progesterone that they give for birth control is actually progestin. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's synthetic. And so it kind of overrides your natural hormone levels of progesterone in keeping a steady level of progesterone where you don't have the peak of it to help with ovulation. Then that keeps your body from potentially not ovulating but that's not always the case either. So then this very same bulletin, say someone wants to take a medication abortion and it's like a woman wants to do that, But the bulletin also says to avoid prescribing or tell the patient to avoid taking the synthetic progesterone as birth control, probably thinking that it's to supplement the effects, but really it actually reverses the effects. So the study it talks about is called Effects of Depromidroxyprogesterone Acetate Injection Timing on Medical Abortion Efficacy and Repeat Pregnancy, a Randomized Control trial. And in the conclusion statement, it says depot medroxyprogesterone acetate administration with mifeprestone did not appreciably increase the risk of surgery after medica- medical abortion, but did increase the risk of ongoing pregnancy. <laughs> so right there, that's the study that this ACOG Bulletin 225 mentions a little later after saying that there's no evidence that progesterone reverses the effects of mifepristone, but now it's saying that this weaker or synthetic progesterone actually really does like warning don't give this for birth control when you're doing a medication abortion because it increases the risk of ongoing pregnancy so riddle me that batman (laughs) that is a direct contradiction in the same bulletin 
And it's just good evidence to show that this whole idea of trying to say that the abortion pill reversal is unproven or unsafe, that it's all an agenda because we are seeing even from the pro-abortion body of obstetricians here saying two different things like that. Like they're trying to still promote their agenda there. Their goal is to make sure the abortion is successful and make sure we get people on birth control. Let's help them kill their babies and then help them not be able to have babies. And that is their agenda. And they're going to be contradictory in what they suggest because their whole belief system like that is contradictory. (laughs) How can you say in one instance where the mom wants the baby, wants to be pregnant, we are going to do everything we can as medical providers to make sure she can carry that baby to term. And we call it a baby. And then on the other hand, the same gestational age, but this mom wants to have an abortion, all of a sudden it's the concept of pregnancy or product of pregnancy or Mm. fetus and contents of the uterus yeah (laughs) and all of a sudden it's not human and we're going to rationalize that yeah we can go ahead and dismember that baby and kill it and even if it somehow survives that we're still going to kill it outside of the womb like Mm. how can you have that dichotomy in your own brain as a provider and offer those services is beyond my comprehension (laughs) I don't know how providers do that, but I think when you live like that and you offer services like that, that you're just a walking contradiction. (laughs) Well said, so you are. And yes, as we're going to walk through their walking contradictions as we get to the House arguing amendments. So what we've heard so far, the clips we've played were committee testimonies on Tuesday, March 28th during House committee. Now, two days later, March 30th, so Thursday, March 30th, In debating amendments for Bill 190, banning the abortion pill reversal, Democrat Representative Kyle Brown claims that abortion pill reversal is not science. So check this one out. Science science has a method, and it matters. And just because you heard something from your friend or you have some sort of anecdote or a handful of people that you heard about that something happened to doesn't mean that it's a scientifically peer-reviewed study that that utilized a double-blind randomized control trial. So, great. Why does all this matter? Because there are no scientific studies that demonstrate abortion pill reversal is safe and effective, these treatments have not been evaluated or approved by the FDA or major scientific or medical organizations. And to allow otherwise would be allowed healthcare pro- professionals to essentially experiment on their patients. Science is important here. It protects patients. It it provides for standards of care that people can rely upon. This bill will ensure that science-based, evidence-based treatments are used, not anecdote, not ideology. That's what's at stake here, is consumer protection. So listen to what Representative Brown's arguments were for protecting people against abortion pill reversal why because it's not scientific science matters and his idea of science is that it needs to be say uh, a randomized controlled trial double blind placebo you know like the uh cranin study was and he also complains that abortion pill reversal that the use of progesterone to reverse the effects of mifeprestone that's not fda approved so he really emphasizes science matters and if it doesn't meet this criteria it's not approved by major medical boards or is fda 
approve. We're essentially experimenting on patients. So this is what's at stake. We're protecting consumers from experimentation. <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying not to laugh, but I'm going to laugh. <laughs> Because when we hear the next clip, uh, you got something to say about that, sweetheart, before we see that ripped to pieces. Yeah. So I think my third point from my testimony that my sister actually took on for me because I didn't have time to get to it, but is basically showing that the British Medical Journal reports that over 50% of the medical treatments we use have no known effective rates because there haven't been studies or maybe limited studies. And yet we still prescribe or recommend those, such as magnesium can help with leg cramps. That hasn't been studied in a controlled study where the FDA approves it and it's been scientifically proven to be effective. Most providers and most people in general just know, yeah, that works and they try it and it works. It doesn't work for everyone, but most of the time it works. And there's so many different ways. And so, yes, medicine is based on science, but there's also that freedom of adapting with it too. Because, and it's not, I mean, experimental is you just have to be careful with that, with the ethics. And that's why there are medical ethics put in place. That's why we have the Hippocratic Oath and we have the Nuremberg Code and all these different things to make sure the way we do experiments or the way we test things are done in a healthy, not detrimental way. But look at all the different cancer treatments that we have. Those are constantly being experimented. <laughs> and, and can we do randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials on all these cancer treatments? <laughs> no. And a lot of times you see these unproven, based science-based controlled studies you see things used still because you have seen it affect <laughs> and you understand the science of, okay, this, this is why it should work. And you talk about it with your patient and say, you know, this hasn't been fr proven, but this is what we've seen. And you go through the risks, the benefits, and the informed consent of, is this something you want to try or not? And then we trust them to make their own decisions and they can decide if they want to try something. And I liked how another representative brought this up in her testimony. But speaking from when you go through a miscarriage and you know you're starting to lose that baby, you want to try anything and everything you can to try and save that baby, mm. to try and keep that. Why is it any different from a girl who took a medication abortion pill? Yeah, She has that same desperation to try and keep that baby inside of her. So it's like basically, okay, in that case as well, you're trying to prevent a miscarriage, if you will. So why can't use the same treatment to prevent a miscarriage in the case of popping a certain medication rather than not? But it's the sacrament of mifepristone with these people. So Representative Brown complained that one of the reasons we can't allow progesterone in this case because it's not approved by the FDA, meaning it's an off-label usage. So then afterwards, after he spoke, a Representative Brandy Bradley kind of lashed out in response. Progesterone has been used safely for over 50 years in pre pregnancy. And before you come up here and talk about it being used as off-label, then don't you dare come talk about it being used off-label as a, a puberty blocker. Because y'all are okay with it being used as a pu puberty blocker off-label, but you're not okay with it saving a baby's life. That is hypocrisy. So she hit the nail right on the head there because, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can't use progesterone off-label. It's not approved by the FDA for this usage, you know, to save a pregnancy in the case of after taking mifeprestone. But Bill 188, which was debated for amendments the next day, <laughs> the Democrats there, the supporters there, <laughs> 
poured out their hearts, as it were, in support of the idea, because part of that bill has to do with so-called gender-affirming care. And basically, that bill wants to protect any means possible of performing so-called gender-affirming care, including surgeries and medications and hormones, puberty blockers, yeah, on anyone of any age, like it's completely allowed for any reason, for any age, you know, any treatment, regardless of it's FDA approved, if it's used off label. And what is one of the things that might be used for the hormone treatment, so called, for maybe making a, a male less masculine in this transition for gender affirming care? <laughs> <laughs> progesterone yeah (laughs) and is that approved by the fda for that usage currently nope that's off label it's off label so oh but wait it it will save lives it will save lives because yeah that was basically their argument for 180 bill 188 and you know gender affirming care at any cost virtually without parental consent virtually for any age just hey surgery puberty blockers hormones whatever it takes you know if someone wants it they get it in colorado under that bill but (laughs) so the fda hasn't approved it's off label for to use progesterone to reverse mifepristone for a woman who wants to save a baby oh that's horrible that's dangerous that hasn't been proved by a double blind placebo randomized controlled trial therefore it's not scientific it's dangerous it's experimenting on people but then you could take puberty blockers for children even give progesterone for that purpose off label and that's not a contradiction they know it was a contradiction they were told before they were told when debating bill 190 on thursday and they were told that's what they were going to argue and of course they argued it with impunity they didn't care about the blatant direct contradiction so the next clip now is from democrat representative karen mccormick arguing that abortion pill reversal is medical fraud and she repeated basically she just belched out and regurgitated the arguments that dr mitchell cranen gave in his testimony And this doctor, this board-certified obstetrician that tried to do this study, and I'll go into that a little bit more here in a minute, um, these are his words, not mine. He's calling this out as medical fraud, and that's all it's about. Um, It's it's not about when life begins. It's not about abortion. It's about the ability of these centers to move forward with medical fraud. And, and that is just not right. That's not right for the medical community. It's not right for patients. It's not right for us um, in this great country of ours. So that seemed to be all that Representative McCormick knew was just to upchuck what <laughs> Dr. Mitchell Cranin had said before, because she pretty much quoted him verbatim there. So she can burn incense at the altar of Dr. Crane and all she wants, but (laughs) the contradictions are still there. Oh, it's so horrible. How could we allow these pregnancy centers to give off-label, unproven treatment of progesterone to save the babies of women? That's just not right, she says. (laughs) <laughs> and now um representative brandy bradley kind of takes her to task there are, are we really talking about truth and talking about a study with four patients is that our truth is that what the people of colorado deserve a study of four people gosh you guys please we just talked about a study with 754 patients. It's called evidence-based medicine. We can't do random control trials in this instance. I have talked at nauseum about this and it just falls on deaf ears. Like I don't wanna keep circling back. And now we're talking about medical fraud because we're saving a baby? Fraud? Wow. 
She definitely has a point there. And as she said, it falls on deaf ears there because I don't think they're really listening to the tidal wave of truth. And yes, they did receive a tidal wave of truth. They received lots of arguments that absolutely demolished theirs demonstrating the blatant hypocrisy and contradictions. I mean, if they were witnesses and it was a prosecuting attorney asking these questions, they would probably be like (laughs) sitting there crying because they couldn't do anything about it. They're just being demolished. But yeah, since these are the people in power, they feel free to wield their power in such a way that truth doesn't matter. They can plug their ears. They can laugh it off. They can pretend that they're not lying and they're not being hypocrites. Doesn't Jesus call some of the people he, (laughs) I can't remember the exact group right now. He was talking to a group of people and he said, you have ears, but you do not hear. Mm. You have eyes, but you do not see. Yes, this is John chapter 12, yeah. (laughs) And that's what you... Quoting Isaiah chapter 6, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see that with the following and watching this committee and the floor debates, that these people just have such hardened hearts. They don't hear the truth at all. They don't see the truth at all. And I mean, that was kind of our prayer leading up to this was that we were like, Lord, please just give them the ears to hear and the eyes to see truth. Because if they could only see but a little bit of truth, you know that that would help. (laughs) And they're just so hardened. Yeah. Before they were going to debate amendments for Bill 190, you know, we're kind of scrambling to, uh, I was trying to get documents to send to our representatives, especially the ones that are opposing these bills like here's more information here's more evidence like you know we can absolutely crush them and of course much of what i gave them i don't know if they got it from me possibly not they had it from some of the testimonies too so they had the information and they presented it like you know as i said it was an absolute tidal wave of truth and i know we're very impressed with some of these republican representatives because sometimes republicans can be wishy-washy but these they were articulate they had the data in spades it was a bone crushing tidal wave of truth that was presented but (laughs) as i said dole of hearing the democrats did not care that their lies were exposed because all they cared about was we have the power to pass this we're going to pretend that we didn't hear that Hello, this is Keith Helsley of Quest for Truth. And I'm Nathan Caldwell. Together, we talk about worldviews. Things that affect our pop culture today. We roleplay the viewpoints represented. We sift through some of the faulty logic in them. And compare them to what scripture says. Once a month, we dig into the Bible. Going through one book at a time. One verse or phrase at a time. Exposing the truth in Scripture. Truth exposed. Hey, that sounds like a good name for a podcast. I like it. How about explicit truth? No. Hmm. How about naked truth? No, no, no. Check out Truth Exposed on the first week every month. You missed something, Keith. Our audio drama. As long as our protectorate players have all their parts in. And our lazy script department has the scripts ready. Um, isn't that you? Make that our hard-working script department. Watch for new audio dramas on the third week of the month. Quest for Truth. Because if it's true... It's true inside the Bible, as well as outside the Bible. Check out life-truth.com. So now the next clip from Representative Brandy Bradley. And yeah, I must say, after listening to her, I really like her. She is (laughs) awesome. (laughs) She's not afraid to speak truth and speaks it very well. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Okay, so I'll pull something else. We, we've had so many people come up here and talk about ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. They had a bulletin. Further evidence pointing to the efficacy of APR is found in ACOG, who everyone's quoted, Practice Bulletin 225, published October 2020. The bulletin details ACOG's guidance on the provision of medication abortion. While they do claim in the bulletin... There is no evidence treatment with progesterone after taking mifepristone increase the likelihood of the pregnancy continuing. But listen to this. They go on to warn abortion providers to avoid administering depot medroxy progesterone acetate, progesterone birth control. So if you're in the middle of having a chemical abortion, ACOG is saying, don't you dare give these people progesterone birth control because you know why? The chances of embryonic and fetal survival by four times, even though the woman has taken the second drug. So which one is it, ACOG? Which one is it? Progesterone doesn't work or it works so well that you should not give a patient birth control after you give them chemical abortion pills. You can't have it both ways. The progesterone provided in DMPA is notably less effective than natural progesterone, but still has a significant impact on fetal survival. I caution you guys to talk about truth under this golden dome. Because when you're talking about four patients, two of which almost died, compared to 754, since the protocol was first used by physicians George DeGaldo and Matthew Harrison, statistics now show that more than 2,500 babies have been saved using this protocol. It is safe and it is effective. And you guys quoting studies of four people is a disservice to the people of Colorado. And I hope that when we argue these other bills coming up, that you don't argue about puberty blockers and the use of progesterone for those, because it's not FDA approved for that either. Thank you. Yeah, so she, we mentioned the ACOG Bulletin 225, and she mentioned that and <laughs> took them to the woodshed showing the blatant contradiction in progesterone. Does it work to reverse? No, but here's the study that shows that it does, and so much so they have to warn that if you want the medication abortion to work, you can't give this progestin here because, you know, it increases the risk. Uh, four times of continuing a pregnancy mm-hmm. yeah so she meant she explains that and i like how she ended that before her time was up there of don't you dare talk to me about fda approval being a problem for abortion pill reversal because tomorrow you're gonna bring up puberty blockers and that's exactly what they did with impunity and they didn't care Now, the next uh, contradiction, and this comes from what we mentioned before about Dr. Crane and claiming that progesterone doesn't, in fact, work well to uh, reverse mifepristone because mifepristone has a tight hold. It blocks the receptors and simply adding more progesterone doesn't work. That is why this makes no medical sense for... If mifepristone is in the body and is locked in to the progesterone receptors, it's locked in. No amount of progesterone swimming around that interaction is going to knock off the mifepristone. In other words, it cannot undo the effects of the mifepristone in the body. (laughs) it's such a hard grip it cannot do no matter how much progesterone you have swimming around except for the fact that ACOG warned that hey if you want a successful medical abortion avoid the progestin as birth control (laughs) but it's so the first note is so strong. She early before that brought up the bear hug analogy that Dr. Crane and gave. And I think she improved it very much because she drew it out and explained it quite a while. And it was humorous to listen to. I didn't play that clip, but, you know, <laughs> trying to keep the episode <laughs> short enough there. <laughs> But yeah, so it's so strong. It's like the strongest person in the room giving a bear hug and no one can break its grip. But hey, you want a successful medical abortion? Avoid the progesterone because there's a risk of ongoing pregnancy, according to ACOG. (laughs) Contradictions galore. Mm -hmm. 
And now, final contradiction for this episode. As I mentioned, as uh, Representative Brandy Bradley mentions, don't you dare bring up using, with the FDA approval problem, that progesterone's not approved, it's off-label, and so therefore it's it's unethical, it's unproven, it's unsafe for saving babies. But then Representative Scott Bottoms, who was a former pastor and now serves in the uh, legislature in Colorado, brought up an amendment to SB 188. So this is the next day as the great prophet representative brandy bradley (laughs) prophesied that they were going to contradict themselves when it came to gender affirming care and puberty blockers because they are currently not fda approved so representative scott bottoms proposed an amendment to the bill that says hey let's make it fda approved and i uh, you know i appreciate his heroism there because he spoke i think probably for over an hour and then his voice was having problems there he presented a full case against the bill but repeatedly was arguing for the amendment like but all we're su- suggesting is that it be fda approved so i'll play a short clip from that and this is a Canadian doctor who helped, actually, this is, this is important to this whole FDA issue, is he says that puberty blockers, now, I don't think he's limited to FDA or not, Dave, because he's from Canada. He's a Canadian doctor. But he says these puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible. And he is one of the guys who pioneered puberty blocker drugs. Now, we're saying here in the state of Colorado This guy's saying they're totally bad all the way across the board. What we're saying here in Colorado, uh, we presented an amendment here that says we would just like this to be FDA approved. That's all. And he kept saying over and over and over again for more more than an hour to pitch the case to basically hold their feet to the fire, (laughs) demonstrating that, wait, they argued yesterday as of that for for bill 190 we can't allow we need to make it illegal we need to ban the abortion pill reversal the use of progesterone in this case because it's off label it's not fda approved for that purpose but um, the whole case for puberty blockers for so-called gender affirming care relies on using uh, hormones and medications that are uh, not approved by the FDA for that purpose therefore they're off label and he was holding their feet to that fire taking them to task with that over and over and over again saying why can't we agree you know i don't like this at all but hey here's an amendment can we at least require that it's fda approved and yeah what happened of course did that change their minds at all after hearing an hour of who knows probably like 30 mentions over and over again of but all i'm suggesting with this amendment is that it be fda approved and nope if they were listening to that i can picture them cringing on the inside knowing that their lies are being exposed with impunity But yet, should we pass the amendment? No, you know, like they just expose themselves for the utter despicable hypocrites and liars that they are. And they don't care because they're going to get their way. And so, yes, um, then they have the third readings for the bills. Today, as we record this, Saturday, April 1st, yeah, fitting day for that, April Fool's Day, you know, we wish that, you know, on April Fool's Day, they could have said, oh, today, the whole thing was an April Fool's joke, haha, we didn't mean to pass these ridiculous bills, but yeah, unfortunately, that wasn't an April Fool's joke for the day, and of course, you know, once again, the opponents of the of these three bills presented their cases, and they presented them with gusto once again they shredded these people they took them to task they absolutely demolished any concept that these bills have any merit they demonstrated how they contradict they demonstrated the pure evil ideology of this how destructive it is so that now we're going to pass a bill that shields abortion providers We're going to pass a bill that will force insurance providers to cover, you know, sterilization and gender affirming.
performing care surgeries and puberty blockers without being FDA approved. And we're going to attack pregnancy resource centers for being deceptive. And we're going to ban abortion pill reversal because it's not FDA approved. And all of that, and so they pass the bills on, and they're going to go to the governor to sign, and he's going to rub his hands together in glee and sign them, and they're going to celebrate. And even the first lady (laughs) is going to visit and celebrate that momentous occasion because of the hypocrites, the evil people who they had truth like there's no tomorrow. They had to cringe through day after day of truth and facts and statistics and logic showing and demonstrating just how what they're doing is really aiming to drive the state of Colorado through the mud. The possible effects of this are just destructive to the economy, destructive to lives, destructive to children and mothers, and they don't care because, hey, they hold the power. And so, yeah, they think they're gods. They think they're laughing their way to the bank. They think power is all that matters and truth, you know, who could care less about truth? But we stand here bold, we stand here confident, after listening to pure evil ooze out, hour after hour, dozens of hours of dragging our brains through this putrid pile of stench. (laughs) Yeah, it was very difficult for us to listen to this. Like, I, you know, as I said, I have never heard such deviltry evil untold disgusting (laughs) like words just smoking out of the pit of hell you know i i cannot describe just how disgusting this was but as i say that we stand bold we have the word of god we have the truth we know truth prevails and as i said earlier kingdoms have risen and fallen But the truth always endures to every generation. And so we hold our heads high. We hold, we know we serve a just God. We know that that God will win, that we know that we will win. So I have a verse that I thought was just very fitting for these last couple of weeks here. And it comes from Isaiah 519. It says, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Yes. And this was just so evident through these last couple of weeks of hearing this. And for some reason, I just liked that. I know the (laughs) first part is not quite fitting, but how they were just like trying to rush these bills through Mm. as fast as they could to get this going. And it was like evil wants to work quickly and Mm. deceitfully. And I mean, you just see that when we're witnessing what has taken place here these last couple of weeks and i think that okay (laughs) this is isaiah talking about this this is something that god sees us he sees what's going on he's not abandoning us he is there with us and he's the one that's giving us strength um and we're praying that he gives us wisdom and just a peace to keep um, fighting Mm. this fight and standing up for truth and standing up for life and yeah i resonate (laughs) your appreciation too babe for the representatives that we heard because Mm. that was very courageous of them to stand up for truth Mm. and they spoke about god Mm. often they spoke about how people are valuable and they're loved and they were created God created boundaries and rules so that we could actually have life and life abundantly. And it was just so refreshing to hear that we have representatives like that that are willing to take hit after hit from the evilness on the opposite side and just hearing I mean, after a while, we kind of knew, like, okay, it's going to be the 42 eyes, the 19 nose, and 
yeah it was like you just knew what was coming that it was down the party line the entire time no amendments were considered they were just trying to rush this through as fast as they could and so yeah that's why i kind of thought isaiah 5 19 to 21 just seemed to fit and the evil people want the righteous to be discouraged. They want us to fear them. They want us to think that they are ultimately powerful and they are gods and that we should just give up and be afraid of them and maybe join them because there's no other alternative. But the righteous, those who have the truth and recognize it, stand up and they will stand up in the face of evil. I want to read Proverbs 1, 29 through 33 that aptly describes these people and aptly describes the hope that the righteous has. So it says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would, or they desire none of my counsel, they despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. That's what they want. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. For whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So that's the hope that we have because we know we shall prevail. Because truth shall prevail and we will not fear the evil. And they think that we shall and they think that they're winning and they will lose. And if they don't repent and embrace the truth, yeah, I would not want to be in their shoes. And then in closing, I just like you mentioned this to me earlier because I mean, honestly, these last couple of weeks have been really hard. Mm -hmm on us just very, very draining <laughs> yeah draining and trying not to lose heart and feel like okay it'd just be easier to sit back in the pews and not do anything and so i just really appreciate just your wisdom and your encouragement and how you will just mention different verses and this one stuck out to me isaiah forty one ten. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Nice. Definitely a good verse to think day by day as we battle the forces of evil. And so we'll ask, ask our listeners to pray for the state of Colorado as it... With these bills, it's like the state government, they want to drag the state into hell and lock the gates and throw away the key, but they will not win. But we pray that God will be merciful, that God will prevent too much damage before the dawn there, and light shines brighter in the midst of the darkest night. And yes, so the truth will shine even brighter as evil gets darker. And so definitely pray for the state of Colorado, and stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso, and God bless. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso. 